This is Spencer with The MacGuffin, and today I'm joined by two of the creative forces behind Pixar's new movie, Inside Out. Uh, on my right, we got Pete Doctor, director, and on my left, we got Jonas Rivera. Is that correct? That's right, thanks. Um, producer. Uh, you guys have worked together before, and I'm going to do a quick, quick little plug for us, because I've said before, on Up in similar positions. And I've long said that Up is, has arguably the best six minutes of film ever in all of cinema, so uh, I'm wow, very excited thanks. to do this. Um, it's actually four and a half, but... Four and a half, okay. It was an it estimate. Like yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. it, it was amazing, but um, it, your guys are here for Inside Out, and I want to sort of start with a kind of uh, bizarre question in that um, people seem to overlook Brave, but people have been talking about original Pixar stuff for years. It feels like, I mean, basically since Up, people are like, when is the next original Pixar film? For whatever reason, Brave kind of gets overlooked. Have you felt any pressure or added excitement with this release since there's been so much built up anticipation of original Pixar projects? Well, it's interesting from within the studio, we don't really think of it that way. I mean, there's always tons of stuff going on. So these films take five years to, to make, so they're all kind of stacked up over each other and there's been original stuff going sure. constantly. So it's it's interesting to hear because it's kind of a an outward perception that we don't really have so much inside. We spend as much focus and attention, regardless of whether it's a sequel or original. Um, we're excited about this one because <laughs> yeah. it's uh, it was a great uh, venue to play with, a, a opportunity to take place to people into worlds that we're all sort of familiar with on one level, but we've never really seen before, you know? Yeah. Um, and explain why songs get stuck in your head and, you know, <laughs> why I can't remember where I put my car keys and things like this. Right. So it was, a, it was a really fun project. Well, that, I mean, that's an interesting point that I was thinking about actually this morning is what was the sort of thought process in terms of, you know, grounding the concept somewhat in reality and exploring them sort of in a creative avenue because there is a lot of stuff. I mean, I, I studied psychology in college and so there's a lot of concepts. I was like, wow, I remember this in school. I remember that. And this, it's, it seems like there's a lot of truth in the fiction as well. well that's good. Yeah. yeah we, we did a lot of research huh? and um, I mean, I think for that reason, we wanted it to be grounded in some sort of truth. We knew it was going to look crazy and fun and bright and, and, and unique, but we wanted it to, like all of our films, to have a nugget of, I don't know, anchored truth in there emotionally and even even physiologically, how the mind might work or how memories might function. Yeah. And so, I mean, at best, we wanted that. At, at worst, we just didn't want, like, the neuroturgeons and scientists to, like, roll their eyes. <laughs> but it was yeah. interesting because, you know, even, like, do they have chairs? Oh, yeah, they probably But is it made out of wood? Where, are you, where do you get wood in the mind? I mean, uh, is it cement? What, what are the things made out of? And that took a lot of... Yeah, where did they get their clothes? We wasted a number of weeks yeah. talking about that. And then we said, oh, it doesn't matter. We just have to make it look good and right. feel right. Yeah, yeah. And we sort of inspired... Uh, we were inspired by, by some, like, uh, uh, you know, brain uh, uh, imagery from uh, science. We didn't want it to look like blood vessels and dendrites. <laughs> it's more the mind. It's a little more abstract, but, uh, but you get inspiration from everywhere. And in terms of the, I mean, I guess I should start by saying that the, it's essentially a story about emotions, but like it is actually a story about emotions and sort of an <laughs> anthropomorphic uh, in a way. Um, what was it like in terms of fleshing out the emotions? Because theoretically, we're working with two dimensional concepts, but you're trying to turn these into three dimensional characters and sort of create that yeah. Yeah. story. <clears throat> That's true. I mean, we started off thinking about them like, well, this could be Pixar's version of the Seven Dwarfs, you know, as characters. Like, really simple, gettable, like, at a glance, you that's joy, that's anger. And I think that, that's where we landed. We're proud of that. Yeah. But at the same yeah. time, yeah, they're, 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 I think it came out of the research, too. Just this fact that they have roles, clinical definitions of, say, disgust, who that has a job. In other words, there's a reason why we have that emotion, which I didn't even think of as an emotion until we started. <clears throat> and that sort of led to, well, if they have roles and they'd have jobs in this story, and if they have jobs and they're going to try to do their jobs really well, and, and then they're going to compete. And it, it, they started becoming people almost in our minds, characters that were just doing their best. And, and that's kind of based on even your original pitch. That's sort of what parents do. And that kind of became our hook into the crafting. Well, I mean, I think it's especially beautiful with joy and sadness <clears throat> because there is, I don't know what you want to call it, a duality or something like that where it's really – ultimately an appreciation for both of them and a complexity for both of them that really is a pretty profound friendship, relationship, right. whatever you want to call oh, thanks. it. Thanks. Yeah, we, we sort of 
realize all of us in life want to be happy. I mean, you go to the bookstore and it's like self-help books, finding your inner <laughs> happiness and all this. So it's obviously something we desire. So it's a rootable goal. Yet life is way more complex than that. And there's disappointment and loss and all these things you have to deal with. And that's where these guys come in. So uh, that was basically the journey we gave to joy was to kind of figure out what is the true kind of deeper meaning of contentment uh, that she can bring to her kid. But I also think that the, just the pure basis of like there is no joy without sadness is a really profound right. message, especially like if you're communicating that to a kid, that's a really interesting, complex concept of trying to be boiling down to a child. So I thought it was really interestingly oh, done. Yeah. Um, what about the balance between the emotional storyline and the, I don't know what you want to call it, the practical storyline, where it's the actual human story that's oh, going yeah. on at the same time? I mean, it seems like that could be a pretty challenging balance because you could either skew too much in one way and you almost forget about the like the human that it's occurring in or you don't give enough of the emotional background and it doesn't really resonate as much of what's actually going on what was it like trying to balance those two aspects of the story that took some doing i mean one of the harder things it was and and um there was a tendency and i remember this on toy story as well that as you get into it there's something uh, more relatable and tangible and less kind of unknown uh, about just the human world and so as we got into it there became more and more kind of focus on that and I kept kind of pushing it back towards the emotion the world of, of the mind because that's the exciting part to me the part we get to go explore new worlds and things but the truth lay in the middle um, if the Riley story on the outside can affect the joy journey and vice versa, then that's where we found like the real sparks started to happen. And the trick with that, of course, is that Riley doesn't even know Joy exists. Mm. And, uh, and yet we wanted somehow her decision making to affect the way Joy, you know, it, it impacts her journey. And so uh, we have finally arrived at this. Uh, it wasn't immediately obvious. We tried a number of other things first, but we arrived at this idea of these personality islands which as Riley rejects certain aspects of her personality, they crumble away. So you have this visceral kind of, you know, earthquake kind of effect on the mind that's affected by behavior, which I think is in part truthful, right? Yeah, very you much train so. your mind by what you do. What you focus a lot of time on physically changes your mind. What is it like, one of the best things about Pixar has always been that your movies speak to people of many ages and levels and whatnot. Um, what is it like trying to balance all those kind of things throughout different groups? I mean, obviously there are going to be jokes and yeah. elements that people don't get at different ages, but what is it to sort of like be able to be like, here's a five-year-old, I don't know what the minimum age yeah, for yeah. something like this is, um, and have them enjoy it as well as like, you know, a 40-year-old. I mean, and that seems like that could be hard to hit both of those groups. I like the minimum age. We should like check IDs. <laughs> Sorry, Ava. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> you're, you're, when were you born? <laughs> um, I, you know, we. I, it's a really good question, and it's something that comes up a lot. And honestly, at the point of origin, we sort of ignore it. I mean, uh, we we. I, mean, I think it's naturally because that's our wheelhouse. Like we we grew up on the Disney movies. Of you know, the, the, sure. everyone grew up on it. We love those, and those feel pretty sophisticated to me now as I watch them as adults, like Bambi mm -hmm. or. Dumbo, you, you know, see different things. I see it really. differently than I did when yeah. I was six, right? Mm -hmm. And and I hope my kids. I have a three year old, a seven year old, and a nine year old. So I did use them. We would, I'd show them stuff, and we even did a screening at Pixar. And it was less about like, will they get it emotionally or even narratively, but more like operationally. Are they are they understanding <laughs> what memories are, what yeah. the jobs are? And we were pleased to find that they did. It's interesting. Whenever we think about it or test it, if we even call it, we're usually. <sighs> pretty blown away at how much kids get. Yeah, they're smarter I, than we think. Yeah, I think that's <laughs> it. I think in general people sort of don't give kids the credit they deserve. If anything, some of the parents <laughs> along the way yeah. were, were a little more, uh, was, it was harder to... Their children have to explain it. <laughs> I did the screening. Well, they sent us as, when we were done uh, around a few countries to test it internationally once the, they dub, we dubbed the films mm -hmm. in different mm -hmm. territories. And I went to Italy, and I'll never forget, we, they, I screened... They screened the film, but I had a translator in my ear telling me about the conversation. There was like a post-screening <laughs> conversation, right? And there's, they took three rows of kids and three rows of parents. And I could kind of tell whose kid was whose by the 45-minute conversation. And this little girl who was six raised her hand because she loved it. And in Italian, she, they said, what would you like about it? And she kind of took five minutes and told the whole story. And she told it beautifully. Like she understood the, their job. She understood the joy and sadness. She understood bing bong and uh, 
the, the memories and what they meant and so forth, I was almost like moved to tears and I was so pleased. Anyways, the conversation kept going and it got to the parents. And a couple of them had raised their hand about hesitating because they thought it might be too esoteric. And one of the guys was her dad. And so they uh, called him and he said, yeah, I, I don't know if five-year-olds or six-year-olds will get it. <laughs> of course, I couldn't say anything. But I'm like, your daughter just said it beautifully. Yeah. It was this interesting moment of, huh, I wonder if this... I wonder if there's something there as a parent, because we're parents and it's, it's, it's emotional for us because of, you know, our watching our kids grow and so forth. And I, I and it just made me wonder that, that, uh, maybe that poor guy's in denial. I'm going back to Italy to talk to that guy. <laughs> okay. He needs some help. <laughs> have, you, have you looked at all at like, sort of like the different interpretations of things people of different ages and emotional development might have? Because I mean, there are people in like my screening, myself included, who are like tearing up at certain moments of that. But do you think that there might be children or something who don't even perceive those emotions at a different age? So like it could be read in multiple different ways if you watch it. I don't know. Like yeah, sort of sure. speaking to what you said with yeah. your Disney movies as a kid. Yeah, right. I mean, right. It's, it's hard to uh, talk about this without giving a major plot point away. Sure. But Maybe there is one character, there's one uh, There's one scene that kids find uh, uh, compelling for one reason, and adults see a whole other level of sort of complexity to what that character represents. Kids, I think, that's kind of past sure. them, but, but that's all is really satisfying when you can create something that works on many different levels, for sure. I, mean, I think even like Toy Story, like kids have talked to me about growing up seeing Toy Story, and I, I don't know if when you first saw Toy Story as a kid, if you, I think it's fun and Buzz is alive and he falls out the window and they have this great adventure. And then you grow up and you're like, oh, that's a movie about not wanting to be replaced. <laughs> like, I don't know what age that, you know, or whatever, jealousy. you know. Yeah, jealousy. Well, we, always, and, we always talked about, like, <clears throat> even a second kid. Like, when mm. your baby sister shows up, yeah. there's that sense of jealousy. Like, hey, I'm the one that gets the attention. So, right. uh, yeah, but you, you, you never know. I but mean, I think that relates different... to my daughters watching it, but I don't think uh -huh. they think of that. No, no, right. not intellectually. It's more of an emotional... We're like yeah. breaking it down for ourselves. Oh, no, that's great. I love it. I love it. Um, <laughs> in terms of the animation, I mean, obviously, you guys can do pretty much whatever you want, lifelike, yeah, whatever. What is it like in terms of sort of determining what you think the appropriate style is for, I mean, obviously outside of the, the, the mind, it's much <clears throat> more sort of, I guess, realistic. Inside the mind, it's much more sort of playful and wild. <laughs> what was it like sort of determining what is appropriate where and how you want to do the entire project? I mean, you could have made it much more realistic all the way through, much more com or, uh, artistic all the way through. I don't know. Like, Well, just for me personally, I'm always interested in pushing things uh, in a new and, and kind of simplified caricature direction. That's that's what I'm drawn to. And in honesty, that was part of what attracted me to this idea because I felt like, okay, if these are emotions, we can make them more uh, feeling-based and expressive and, and caricature than, than we would if they were just like people, right? So, um, and one of the exciting things about this film made it a little more hard difficult for the, uh, the uh, art department, but we have these two separate worlds, right? We have mm -hmm. the, the mind world, which is a completely different look than the human world. <laughs> and um, we really got to push extremes yeah. on that. So I think it really kind of comes from the story. You know, mm -hmm. in this case, movie about emotions, uh, we really tried to push the exaggeration and caricature and things that we grew up with, like uh, Tex Avery and Chuck Jones cartoons, those all fed into the basic look of that, whereas then the human world is a little bit more grounded. It's not totally real, uh, but it's got some sure. wonderful textural things yeah. and uh, the lighting cues and throughout. We could talk for hours about just how we <laughs> push those two into their different yeah. uh, different looks. But they're even tied at some level too. The sure. uh, Ralph Eggleston, our production designer, had this thought. Uh, or maybe you, I don't even remember, but the mind, as we're de developing the geography of the mind, and it was, and we were setting the film in San Francisco, that uh, the mind was all about connection and these lines and things that would lead to the islands and light lines and so forth. And 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 then we realized, well, San Francisco is sort of like that. Mm. It's hilly. It's it's under wires. It's got cable cars that are connected, and yep. it, it just seemed. And the fog would roll in. It <laughs> seemed like this cool echo of. What we what was in the real world that we could caricature and push and somehow make relatable it was kind of neat. That's great. Um, in terms of you two guys, like um, you obviously work together on Up. I'm sure you've all sort of collaborated with different people at Pixar and all sorts of stuff. What was it like working together again on this project? Did you had already developed a shorthand? Had it did it benefit you? Like what was that experience like doing this whole feature thing again together? Yeah, I think in our case we had a great time working yeah. together on Up. Really established like a 
a level of trust and uh, a knowledge of kind of how each other think. Jonas just has a great way of assembling top-notch crew, not only in terms of talent, but in terms of being wonderfully collaborative, nice people. Um, and he, he's really able to focus out of all the insanity of everything that goes into a movie like this. You know, there's billions of decisions. And Jonas <laughs> like, here's what we need to do today or this week or this month. And it really helps like focus and, and uh, drive things forward. So uh, yeah, and it's not just us. I mean, in a way we got, um, cause we love working together. And I think we, we, are able to kind of make some fun things but we also have an amazing team that we were able to like get the band back together a little bit on this I mean Ronnie Del Carmen is our co-director he's the one that crafted or helped craft that opening of Up our editor Kevin Nolting who's a huge part of this Josh Cooley our story supervisor uh, the production management I mean we, we have sort of a core team that we we try to strong arm Pixar into letting us keep close as we put these teams together so we're very lucky very cool. Uh, film is Inside Out. It comes out June 19th. Do you guys have Twitters or anything that people can use to follow what you guys have going on? Pick, Inside Out does, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Pick, we, we're the, well, you have Instagram. I have an Instagram account. Yes. I think I'm just Pete Doctor, right? I don't... You are Pete Doctor, right? I'm an old man. Yeah, I, I'm the worst social media person on earth, but I, I, Pixar I, does, Inside Out does the movie, and uh, you should check it out because sometimes they put embarrassing pictures of us on there. Oh, it's, fantastic. It's awesome. yeah. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't worry about the social media. Plenty of people say that, and I'm sure you're fine. Okay. Um, <laughs> thank you guys so much. Thank you, Pete Jonas. I thank can't you, wait to you. see uh, the film again, and I uh, look forward to what you guys are doing next. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Because I've got space game and a few.